The rate at which homosexuality has attained cultural acceptance in the West has been astonishing. In 1987, the British Social Attitude Survey conducted a poll that revealed that 75% of the British population at that time believed homosexual behaviour to be always or mostly wrong. Only 11% claimed that it was never wrong. So, said another way, 89% of the country at that time had some kind of negative attitude towards homosexuality. By 2012, however, when the same organisation ran the same poll, they discovered that only 28% of the population now believed homosexual behaviour was always or mostly wrong, while 47%, nearly half, said that it was never wrong. Of course, today we have journeyed still further. Homosexuality is now so widely approved of that gay marriage has been enshrined in law. It's actively promoted as a healthy alternative lifestyle, and people who dare to speak against it will usually find themselves being branded as a bigot and a hater, and possibly even at risk of prosecution on hate speech charges. Now, of course, many on the left call this change in attitudes progress. They believe this is evidence that we're becoming more tolerant and loving and committed to equality. Their ideology tells them that a love-filled utopia lies this way just over the horizon. They view themselves as pioneers of a brave new world. But believe it or not, this isn't the first time in history that a culture has embraced homosexuality. No trails are being blazed here. The Bible says, what has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new, it has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. So the Bible is saying, you think you're doing something new? This has all been done in ages past. We just don't remember it. And when we don't remember former things, the risk is that we repeat the same mistakes over and over. This is why we pause to remember fallen soldiers on November 11th every year, because in remembering those former things, we hope to guard against it happening again in the future. Now, homosexuality was rife about 2,000 years ago in Greco-Roman culture. Craig Turner says, The practice of homosexuality in the Roman Empire had increased during the early years until the Romans accepted and adopted the pedestry of the Greeks. Though at first the acts were considered acceptable only if the boy was a slave, the Romans eventually extended their tolerance of homosexual acts to adult men, both free and slave. Same-sex marriage, once unthinkable, was not far behind. The normalisation of homosexuality in ancient Rome came in incremental stages. At first it was only deemed acceptable with slave boys, then the boundaries were slackened a bit more and it was considered acceptable between free adults. Then it ended with the acceptance of full-blown gay marriage. The Roman historian Tacitus reports that by the first century even emperors like Nero indulged themselves in these things. So again, our culture is not blazing a trail here. Societies have passed this way before. And throughout all history, the gradual normalization of homosexuality within the Roman Empire has been universally accepted to be a sign of its moral decay. Academics declared that the Roman Empire collapsed because it became hedonistic. Flagrant homosexuality was merely a marker that the cultural degradation had reached its latter stages. The prominent Italian historian and the deputy head of the country's National Research Council, Robert Di Mattei, attracted a storm of outrage from liberals in 2011 when he said that the Roman Empire collapsed because of a contagion of homosexuality and effeminacy. Talking about how we're now making the exact same mistakes, he said, Today we live in an era in which the worst vices are inscribed in law as human rights. In other words, the renormalization of homosexuality is not a sign of progression to a brand new future. It's a sign of regression to a degraded past that's already been. We're falling backwards here. So again, let's look at the arguments surrounding this. There is no conclusive scientific evidence to believe that anyone is born gay. Scientists have been trying to prove this for decades with no success. There have been sensational claims, of course. In 1991, a homosexual neuroscientist called Simon LeVay conducted a study showing small differences in the anterior hypothalamus region of heterosexual and homosexual male brains. Basically, the heterosexual's hypothalamus, on average, was much larger. The newspapers at the time pounced on this data, claiming that brain size had been scientifically proven to dictate sexual preference. But it wasn't true. The wider scientific community poured over the data, ran their own tests and discovered a problem. 
All of LaVey's gay participants were found to have HIV AIDS, and this disease is known to shrink the size of the hypothalamus by decreasing testosterone levels. Therefore, the size differences he witnessed were just a result of that disease, not a root cause of homosexuality. Indeed, there are a number of factors that cause changes to the size of the hypothalamus. Ruth Hubbard, a professor of biology at Harvard University, and George Wald, a Nobel Prize winner in physiology and medicine, after conducting studies of their own, completely rubbished LeVay's findings, saying there was no way to tell anything about an individual sexual orientation by looking at his hypothalamus. In fact, LeVay later said himself in 2011 that his findings had simply been misinterpreted by the press. It's important to stress what I didn't find. I did not prove that homosexuality is genetic or find a genetic cause for being gay. I didn't show that gay men are born that way, the most common mistake people make in interpreting my work, nor did I locate a gay center in the brain. Soon after LeVay, in 1993, came a homosexual geneticist called Dean Hamer. He published a paper in Science magazine stating that genetic markers on the X chromosome could influence the development of same-sex attraction in men. So basically he was claiming that homosexuality is coded into some people through their DNA and they have as much control over it as they do over the colour of their hair or their eyes. Now while gay gene headlines made for sensational newspaper sales, the wider scientific community was again quick to point out that his whole study was fatally flawed. A Canadian team tried to replicate Hamer's findings and came up with completely different results. They said at the time, it is unclear why our results are so discrepant from Hamer's original study. Because our study was larger than that of Hamer, we certainly had adequate power to detect a genetic effect as large as was reported in that study. Nonetheless, our data do not support the presence of a gene of large effect influencing sexual orientation at position XQ28284667. They continued, these results do not support an X-linked gene underlying male homosexuality. So as quickly as Hamer's theory had come to prominence, it too had been completely refuted. By 2012, scientists had largely become exasperated with brains and genes, so they changed tack once again. They proposed that perhaps sexual preference was dictated by variations in hormone levels that fetuses are exposed to in the womb. As usual, the media jumped on the idea, ran some sensational headlines, and as usual, the data wasn't as conclusive as it first appeared. In fact, liberals began tiring of these constant disappointments. Samantha Allen, writing for the Daily Beast in 2014, said, The popular media, once so easily convinced by LeVay that homosexuality resulted from brain size and by Hamer that homosexuality was genetic, promptly changed its tune to declare that homosexuality was now epigenetic. Hooray! If it's hard to get excited about these studies is because at this point biological explanations for homosexuality are like iPhones, a new one comes out every year. Today, there is still absolutely no conclusive scientific proof that anyone is born gay. All the studies have proven completely futile. However, let's imagine for a moment that at some point in the future, scientists did discover a gay gene. Would it necessarily legitimize the gay lifestyle? Well, think of it like this. Imagine that scientists one day discovered a paedophile gene that proved that some people are naturally attracted to children. What would our reaction to that be? Would we say, well, since the paedophiles are born that way, then let's legalize paedophilia and call anyone who opposes it an intolerant paedophobe. It turns out that the poor things are just a marginalized minority who need equality. Would we say that? What if we found an addiction gene that proved that some people are born with a natural tendency towards drug addiction? Would that discovery lead us to say, well, the drug addict was simply born that way, he can't help it. So let's brand anyone who opposes drug addiction as a bigoted drugophobe. Let's have drug pride marches where we watch addicts taking cocaine on the street and wave flags in support because they're just expressing who they are. And let's throw opponents to drug addiction in jail under hate speech charges if they dare to suggest that it might not be entirely healthy. Would we say that? As we go deeper into the left pit, we might one day. But right now, I hope that this generation still has the sense to say no. I hope that we realize that it doesn't matter what we're naturally inclined to do, we still have responsibility to live by some kind of objective moral code, a sense of righteousness that informs us which impulses to allow and which impulses to reject.
Remember, what comes naturally to us isn't always good. The Bible tells us that we all inherited a sinful nature from Adam and Eve, and because of it, many of humanity's impulses are selfish, cruel, and deceptive. This is why you never need to teach a child to take a cookie from the cookie jar and then lie about it. This is why you never need to teach them to take another child's toy. Children will do these things anyway because they are hardwired with a sinful nature. Because it comes naturally, though, it doesn't mean that theft and lying is good, and this is why parents train their children to fight against their own natural impulses. Instead, we teach our children to share and be honest and kind even when they don't want to be. And in adulthood, it's exactly the same. We have urges within us to lust and gossip and fight and commit adultery, but it's our regard for righteousness that stops us surrendering to all of those natural but bad impulses. And this is good. If we did surrender to all of our natural impulses, there would be damage, impotence, disease, jealousy, pain, sadness, For any happiness in this world, quite a lot of restraint is going to be necessary. And it's a respect for hard righteousness that gives us this moral restraint. So again, just because it's there within us, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's good. We still have to ask the moral question. Now, some argue that since homosexuality exists in the animal kingdom, that should make it okay for humans too. The general line of reasoning is, well, if a sheep does it, then it must be natural. And if it's natural, then it must be okay for humans as well. Firstly, remember that it's not just human nature that was corrupted by the fall. It was all of nature. The world as it exists today is not the world God originally designed. Paul writes, but with eager hope, all creation looks forward to the day when it will join with God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. So nature isn't always a reliable guide for what's right and wrong. After all, we live in a universe now where disease has become natural, where disasters have become natural, where war has become natural. God didn't design these things and yet they're here. So we have to look outside of nature to the one who designed it for guidance. What did God originally mean by creation? Well, he tells us repeatedly through his word that he didn't mean homosexuality. Now, secondly, even if you don't accept the Bible's authority on this, it should be noted that homosexuality isn't even particularly prevalent in the animal kingdom. Earlier, we discovered that only 1.7% of humans identify as gay. Well, the numbers of animals exhibiting gay behaviors are at least as low. Even Simon LeVay said, A homosexual orientation, if one can speak of such things in animals, seems to be a rarity. He says that even homosexual behaviours that are exhibited are often not due to same-sex attraction, but rather down to other animalistic motivations. For example, dogs may mount one another as a show of dominance. LeVay therefore goes on to say, It seems to be very uncommon that individual animals have a long-lasting predisposition to engage in homosexual behaviour to the exclusion of heterosexual activities. So even in the animal kingdom, heterosexuality is the normative position. Thirdly, even if it were prevalent in animals, in what world would we be sane to take our sexual morality from a goat or a crab? The animal world abounds with practices that no human would attempt, and rightly so. I remember a wildlife program years ago where shocking footage was shown of a group of monkeys launching a frenzied attack on another one and killing it. Warnings were given before the show, and I actually didn't watch it because I couldn't stomach the thought. So who in their right mind would have watched that documentary and thought, well, if monkeys are committing brutal gang murders, then it must be natural, and that means it's okay for humans too. In the same way, who's ever seen a dog eating poop and thought, well, if dogs do it, then it must be natural. Let's let's go eat some poop. If we've never had those thoughts, and I imagine we haven't, then why would we see homosexual behaviors in a cow and think, well, if a cow is doing it, the logic is simply flawed. Children don't feel gay. In fact, children don't feel any sexual awareness until puberty, which generally begins around 11 or 12 years old, sometimes earlier, but around that age. What they perhaps mean is that when they developed a sexual awareness at that age, they found a homosexual impulse already within them and then assumed, well, it must have been here this whole time. I guess it's been there since birth. But this is the great unsayable about homosexuality. It is normally caused by psychological scarring and emotional trauma in those early developmental years before puberty. Here's the words of an ex-gay man called Joseph Sayambra who wrote this piece about his time in the lifestyle. Generally, as is the case, more so after the sexual revolution, 
Gay men enter the lifestyle while in their late teens or early 20s. At that age, there are plenty of opportunities to express oneself and to experiment. This newfound power can be heady at first. For instance, you were once the kid that no one wanted on their team, or the boy with the overly critical and unloving father, or the scared child that someone touched. Suddenly, you are with people who have largely gone through the same thing, though almost never admitting it. Instead, everyone plays out the trauma of youth in a bizarre ceremony of reenactment as healing. Now you can dance into the throng, feel their warm bodies next to you and imagine that you're finally part of the group. Older men who want you to call them daddy ask you out and that moment of shame and embarrassment from your childhood doesn't seem strange or horrifying anymore because you can live it over again and draw pleasure from it under what you think are your own terms. Although I observed a genuine affection between gay men, it was akin to the instant camaraderie which indelibly links all horror survivors. For this was the characteristic that I witnessed in every same-sex couple a bond of suffering enkindled by their shared memories of a childhood gone wrong. Failed parents, tales of bullied boys and lonely nights spent crying out for love. It was a marriage forged through experience of coming out, finding an introductory pride and hope in the gay lifestyle, then seeing it dashed by the reality of the collective gay self-centeredness and its propensity towards meaningless sex. They flee it and by doing so, reveal its inherent dysfunction. At the root of most homosexuality isn't a shrunken hypothalamus or a gay gene or hormone levels in the womb. It's normally just a child who is fatherless or isolated or abused. It's the result of emotional trauma and psychological scarring in formative years. It's a boy who never had a father and who then craves that missing masculine love. It's a kid who was bullied at school. It's a girl who had an abusive father and who now hates men. In fact, here's an ex-lesbian story. She's called Jackie. Born with an inherent disposition to sin, mixed with fatherlessness, molestation, and limited to no examples of trustworthy men, led me into a lifestyle of homosexuality. It was a way of life I willingly embraced. My style of dress and behaviour was somewhat indicative of my personality. A girly girl can never be used to describe Jackie. An aggressive tomboy was more like it. Therefore, the girls I attracted were typically everything that allowed me to become what I thought I wanted to secretly be. A man. I always saw men as being something to envy. They seemed strong, powerful, in control. Femininity, or the skewed view of it that I held, seemed weak. Part of my embracing masculinity and rejecting femininity was my own way of protecting myself from pain. Pain that I believed men were capable of subjecting me to. After all, that's what my father did to me. That's what I saw men do to my mother. That's what I witnessed my guy friends do to the women they claimed to love. All I knew of men was that they used their manliness as a means to inflict pain and us women, us weak beings, were target practice. In his book, My Genes Made Me Do It, A Scientific Look at Sexual Orientation, Dr. Neil Whitehead writes, Ex-gay support groups report that between 50% and 60% of homosexual men coming for help have been abused sexually. This is confirmed by various researchers. Ex-gay groups report high levels of male sexual abuse, up to 85% in female homosexuals who come for help. Rather than affirming this dysfunction then, we should be helping people to find healing. Surely that is the most loving thing that we can do. As Joseph and Jackie's stories tell us, you can leave the homosexual lifestyle. Jackie finishes her testimony by saying, I am a Christian, a wife, a mother, and a woman who is being made strong in her weaknesses, and I love it. There are many other ex-gay people out there too. Author and ex-lesbian Alma Kramer writes, I made a choice to be a lesbian in my life that put me in bondage for 20 years. While it's true that there were certain things in my childhood that happened or didn't happen that influenced my choice, I still made a choice. Wow, I'm so so glad that we can change. I can remember the time when I thought that there was no way out. Ex-lesbian Yvette Cantu Schneider says, I came out of homosexuality after a powerful encounter with Jesus Christ and a desire to serve and obey him. I can say with complete honesty that I never have homosexual desires of any sort, physical or emotional. Ex-homosexual and ex-gay rights leader Michael Glatt says, homosexuality is death and I choose life. There are many more success stories. Is it easy? No, but is it possible? Absolutely. 
Homosexuals first and foremost harm themselves. They are 50% more likely to suffer from depression and to engage in substance abuse. They are 200% more likely to commit suicide. They will die around 20 years earlier than straight people as a direct result of the increased disease involved in their lifestyle. They are destined never to find a settled life partner. The Journal of Sex Research tells us that 85% of heterosexual married women stay faithful. 75% of heterosexual married men stay faithful. Faithful, whereas just 4.5% of homosexual men stay faithful. That's a huge gap that gives us insight into the brokenness of the gay lifestyle. The promiscuity means that even though gay people are under 2% of the population, they make up 61% of HIV cases. It is vastly more disease prone. Furthermore, the incidences of domestic violence between homosexual men is nearly double that of the heterosexual population. A Northwestern University study involving 30,000 participants reported, one of our startling findings was that the rates of domestic violence among same-sex couples is pretty consistently higher than for opposite-sex couples. Previous studies have suggested that as many as 75% of the homosexual population will experience domestic violence at some point in their lives. The amount of promiscuity, disease, violence and early death prevalent within the gay lifestyle doesn't speak of a perfectly healthy, legitimate alternative lifestyle because it isn't. The facts speak of people who are hurting, confused and broken because they are. In 1989, a book called Heather Has Two Mommies was released amidst a storm of controversy. Google Books called it the first lesbian-themed children's book ever published. It represented a startling first in children's literature, a story about the daughter of lesbians. The book was designed to present a positive image of gay parenting that might help to change the public opinion. In 2015, the book was re-released, but in an interesting twist, the girl who was the subject of the book, Heather Barwick, then 31 years old and a married mother of four, released an open letter explaining just how much pain it had actually caused her to be raised by lesbians. She says, Do you remember that book, Heather Has Two Mommies? That was my life. Growing up and even into my 20s, I supported and advocated for gay marriage. It's only with some time and distance from my childhood that I'm able to reflect on my experiences and recognize the long-term consequences that same-sex parenting had on me. And it's only now as I watch my children loving and being loved by their father each day that I can see the beauty and wisdom in traditional marriage and parenting. Same-sex marriage and parenting withholds either a mother or father from a child while telling him or her that it doesn't matter, that it's all the same. But it's not. A lot of us, a lot of your kids are hurting. My father's absence created a huge hole in me and I ached every day for a dad. I loved my mom's partner, but another mom can never have replaced the father I lost. I grew up surrounded by women who said they didn't need or want a man, yet as a little girl I so desperately wanted a daddy. It's a strange and confusing thing to walk around with this deep down unquenchable ache for a father, for a man, in a community that says that men are unnecessary. There were times I felt so angry with my dad for not being there for me, and then times I felt angry with myself for even wanting a father to begin with. There are parts of me that still grieve over that loss today. I'm not saying that you can't be good parents. You can. I had one of the best. I'm also not saying that being raised by straight parents means everything will turn out okay. We know there are so many different ways that the family unit can break down and cause kids to suffer. Divorce, abandonment, infidelity, abuse, and death, etc. But by and large, the best and most successful family structure is one in which kids are being raised by both their mother and father. Gay marriage doesn't just redefine marriage, but also parenting. It promotes and normalizes a family structure that necessarily denies us something precious and foundational. It denies us something we need and long for, while at the same time telling us that we don't need what we naturally crave, that we will be okay. But we're not. We are hurting. So you see, homosexuality does harm others. This lovely picture here is just an ideologically driven myth. Okay, this is really the core of the issue now. With all statistics, science and truth stacked up against the pro-gay position, an extraordinary thing has recently happened and it could only have happened in a left pit. People have stopped caring about all that stuff. They just don't care what the truth is anymore. They don't care about the moral arguments or even the scientific arguments. 
Samantha Allen writes, As homosexuality approaches a critical mass of cultural acceptance, more and more people are comfortable challenging the dominant born that way narrative. In 2012, Sex and the City star Cynthia Nixon caused a stir when she told the New York Times that her lesbianism is a choice. When she faced pushback for this statement from the LGBT community, Nixon held her ground saying, Why can't it be a choice? Why is that any less legitimate? It seems we're ceding this point to bigots who are demanding it, and I don't think they should define the terms of the debate. Simon Copland of The Guardian agrees, noting that lesbian and gay people should refuse the nature or nurture dialectic and demand respect regardless of how homosexuality comes about. To accept these terms, Copland rightly argues, would be to constrain both the freedom of LGBT politics and the fluidity of sexuality itself. After all, it's not 1996 anymore. In 2014, the gay gene simply doesn't matter. The science behind it is narrow and inconclusive. Its rhetorical potential, if it ever had any, has been thoroughly exhausted. And at this point, continuing to pursue a genetic explanation for homosexuality could do more harm than it does good. It doesn't matter whether or not you were born this way. What matters is being accepted the way you are, however you got there. The New Scientist said something very similar. It said, ultimately what causes homosexuality doesn't matter as much as the fact that homosexual people exist and have always existed in every society on earth. In the words of the activist, some people are gay, get over it. Julie Bindle wrote for the New Statesman saying, there is no gay gene and I love the idea that I chose to be a lesbian. Liberals are realizing that the truth about genes and brain size, disease, promiscuity, and all of that factual information just isn't stacking up in their favor. And if they pursue that line of argument any further, it might do their cause more harm than good. So what they're saying now is, well, ignore all of that stuff, the science and the stats and the truth, that doesn't really matter. Some people are just gay, get over it. Love is love and love is all that matters. And what's more, and this is the key, they're discovering that because all of culture has moved into the left pit along with them, everyone else pretty much feels that way now too. People increasingly don't care about the facts behind homosexuality. Samantha Allen again says, the magic bullet for the acceptance of homosexuality seems to be the act of knowing an actual gay or lesbian person, not reading a study that suggests the possibility of a shared genetic marker on the XQ28 region of the X chromosome. While the percentage of Americans who believe that homosexuality is innate has only ticked upward 11% since 1997, the percent of Americans who know a gay or lesbian person has increased more than 35 percentage points over that time, according to the same Gallup poll. In terms of promoting LGB equality then, it doesn't seem to matter as much whether or not people believe that gay people are born that way as it does that they simply know someone who is currently gay, no matter how they were born. Friendship is the trump card in the movement for equality, not etiology. So the bottom line for our left pit culture is that we don't really care about the facts anymore. Facts mattered in the modern era, but they don't matter in the postmodern era. We're in a post-truth society now. The thing is that we know a gay person and our heart feels sympathy for them. We saw a gay comedian on TV and he seemed funny. We saw a heart-tugging storyline of a gay person being bullied on a soap opera and we felt heart sore for them. We've been emotionally led down this path by our hearts and in the process we've been willing to switch off our brains entirely and we've been willing to condone immorality in the process. As ever, when we do this, it leads to absurdities. Earlier we caught a glimpse of the world's first three-way same-sex marriage. The three men went on record to say, Some people may not agree and are probably amazed by our decision, but we believe that many people do understand and accept our choice. In the 21st century, love is love after all. Of course it is. If love is all that matters, then why not three men together? Indeed, why not ten? Why not a man and a zebra? Why not a zebra and a lamppost? No absurdity is too great when we turn away from the hard virtues, reject the idea of truth, Truth, reason and righteousness and claim that love is all that matters. Indeed, how long before people start saying that paedophilia is also a valid expression of love or that incest is also a valid expression of love? Without a sense of righteousness, the left pit mindset has no safeguard against this. Is there anything wrong with gay marriage? <laughs> no. There's nothing weird about that, do you think? No, no, let people love. As long as they're consenting adults? Yeah, of course. That's fine, right? Yeah. So, do you have any problem? Would you think it would be weird if one of your friends was having sex with their sister? How, how does that relate? Well, they're two consenting adults, so we're just uh, using liberal logic if you think that it's totally normal 
to have uh, homosexual relationships. I, I hate the idea, but if both are happy with it and they don't have any kids, then like, sure, I don't see a huge problem with it. So you think incest marriage is, is, is okay? Nothing weird about that? No, it's super weird, but if it's not hurting anybody, then I don't care. So by calling it weird though, aren't you being a bigot and an incest phobe like the liberals are saying the Christians are for saying that gay people are weird? You're, you're, you're an incest phobe? You're a bigot against I mean, incest? it makes me, it makes, it makes me uncomfortable. Okay. So is there anything wrong, if a Christian or conservative thinks that homosexuals are weird or it mm -hmm. makes them uncomfortable to see these people on television, uh, do you think that there's something, do you think they're being bigots because they think that it's perverted to, it makes them feel uncomfortable to see these, uh, this gay agenda? I think it's, I think it's fine as long as they're not hating on anybody, as long as they're not hurting people and insulting them just you got to just let people what they do what they want to do it's like the incest thing not into it but if people are that's fine with me it doesn't affect me i don't want them to have kids because you know there's some biologically like messed up stuff possibly so you would approve of incest marriage then <laughs> <laughs> i mean sure why why not what do you say about the people who say that homosexuals are disgusting? What do you feel about those critics of the LGBT community? I think they're disgusting. You think they're disgusting? Yeah. So you, you agree that two consenting adults should be able to have a sexual relationship of their preference without being called disgusting or perverts, correct? Yeah. So if uh, one of your best friends was having sex with his sister, uh huh. Would you say that's disgusting or perverted? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's so you're an incest phobe then. So so you are judgmental about two consenting adults having a sexual relationship. Well, like relationship the thing about then. incest is that if the woman it's were not to become pregnant, that there's severe birth defects to the child. So let's say they're not going to have children though. Well, so you're, it you're, could still happen. They're they're not going to have children. They're just they're having a consensual incestuous relationship. So you think that's then, disgusting? Well, that's fine. If if they're not going to have kids, there's no there's no reason for me to judge them. So there's nothing wrong with a brother and a sister having sexual relations with each not other. Not if they're not going to have kids. Totally normal. Yeah. All right. <laughs> thank you. Just checking. If the sister wants it and the brother wants it, go for it, dude. If the guy has a vasectomy and there's no children involved, would you no do? No children. Yeah. So you I wouldn't tell them not to do what they want to do, but I wouldn't do it. Until if some folks want to practice incest, is that are they going to be welcomed in your safe space? Um if there are two consenting adults? Like if there're two consenting adults I mean, I guess so. <laughs> If we don't start loving truth and righteousness again, we're on a very dark road here. As Christians, we simply want to encourage individuals to form healthy, natural relationships, raise healthy children, and to know the God who made them, because ultimately, that is best for everyone.